What is going on, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday edition of the Stochastic NHL Strategy Show. I am your host, Josh Harris. King Bacon Pie wants to say hello. That's fine. Um, it is a nice day here in New Jersey. Nice little, almost 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Very nice here. How's it uh, up in Cliffy Land? What's going on? Oh. Uh not a whole lot. Yeah, nice out here today. Uh, sunshine, 9 degrees Celsius, which is, I don't know, like low 50s, like around 50 or something like that. But that's pretty good uh, for this time of year. Um, oh, not a whole lot. Just <laughs> I was wondering about the Jets. I was watching Nashville and Winnipeg play last night. Like Nashville, I, I want to say that Jason Zucker signing was – or trade was kind of underrated. Like Zucker's not – a bad player, right? Um, he had 27 goals for Pittsburgh last year. I think it was 27 goals. And, you know, he did play in the top six with the Penguins, so that helps. But two of those, only two of those 27 goals were on the power play. So even though, you know, maybe he doesn't get power play time at Nashville, but he now gives them, like, legitimate scoring depth, right? Like, that was kind of the problem, you know, until the last couple of weeks, they really didn't have a lot of secondary scoring, especially with no back hurt. Evangelist is a guy that came on the last couple of weeks. Now you have Zucker there who can kind of give you a little bit of secondary scoring. You have no back and Evangelist on a different line, give you another bit of boost in the scoring. You still have UC Saros in that, who's been almost as good as anybody else, basically since Christmas, the, the West at the top looks terrifying. Like you look at Colorado, um, Vegas once they once they get Hurdle and Stone back, Edmonton's just steamrolling teams left and right. Um, Dallas is you know four lines deep with two great defense pairs. The top of the West looks really tough, but I, man, Nashville looks like it's it, as long as they, you know Saros doesn't get hurt like he did before the playoffs last year. That's gonna that could be a tough out in the first round. Yeah, and they only gave up a sixth round pick for Zucker. And like he was just not a fit in Arizona to the style of play. Like Nashville play their offense is more a style of play that Pittsburgh is. So I think he'll fit in very nicely there. Got a nice 12 gamer here tonight. Had a uh, four gamer last night. It's nice that there's no Edmonton, no Colorado on the slate. Like I'm just sick of like, oh, should I spend thirty eight thousand to fit Colorado one and their nineteen full line goals in tonight? Like they went from playing Dan Vladar to uh, Casey DeSmith last night. It's just like, what, what are we doing? Luckily, Edmonton was on the slate who, you know, they got two power plays early and they just cruised from there. But the highest priced line on this slate is 21 and change. You're not going to have to make a decision where you want to, whether you want to commit like 58% of your salary to a line. You can actually like breathe and put in a nice secondary line with these lines. So um, I like this slate. We were talking this morning, and I think it it's kind of important. Like I, I said something like unabated with no stats to back it up, that bad teams after the trade deadline are just all, like way worse. And you went and looked it up, and, it, you know, the expected goals against for these teams just go way up because – they're bad teams already and they trade any piece that's like viable. So they obviously get worse. So like stacking against these teams that traded away players and have nothing to play for, even if there is a little bit of higher ownership could be uh, a lot more profitable here. Yeah. Um, what I saw was leading up to the, it was like 65 games, give or take for teams like between 62 and 66 games or whatever, leading up to the deadline last year, no team, gave up more than four goals per 60 minutes. And then after the deadline, you had, I think it was four teams giving up at least four goals per 60 minutes. And, you know, sometimes it's an anomaly or whatever. I looked at the year before, again, leading up to the deadline, no team was higher than 3.75 goals against per 60. And then from the deadline to the end of the season, there were three teams that were over four goals against per 60 minutes. So like, it, you know, bad teams get worse when they trade because, the, you know, they only have a handful of good players and anybody that can get traded usually does. Um, you, you know, we kind of saw that with Calgary to an extent, right? Um, we'll talk about them later. But, um, yeah, bad teams get worse, which is why, like, Montreal's on this slate. We'll talk about my Canadians a little bit later. 
you didn't really lose. Like they, yeah, they lost Sean Monahan, but um, Alex Newhook was injured for three months or whatever it was, right? And so he comes back, you just plug him into Monahan's spot, and then you just keep rolling along. So I, I don't know if they're going to get as bad as like Chicago or San Jose, or um, certainly looks like Ottawa is trending in that direction. We'll talk about them later, but yeah, it it certainly does seem to be the case that uh, bad teams get worse, good teams get better. And we got to think about that when we're playing DFS. Yeah. And the teams I was mainly talking about here are the Sharks, but which it's like impossible to, to think that they could actually get worse, but they might have. Calgary, they lost their top three. Uh, penalty killers, you know, Columbus. I know the Rosselvic trade wasn't like a huge trade, but like they suck. Arizona's <laughs> lost 14 in a row. The Senators just suck. So, like, a lot of, a lot of crap on this slate but there are a lot of good teams and we should get into get into it before we do just wanted to say appreciate you guys for all your support we appreciate you guys for all your support with the affiliate signups with the super chat with the sharing of the videos with the likes with the banter with whatever you you know tell a friend tell your uncle's brother's former roommate like we appreciate it that was a uh spaceballs reference for the young kids in the chat um Let's get into this slate, though, before I go off on a massive tangent. New York Islanders with a 2.9 total heading into Buffalo. The Sabres have a three total. Neither of these teams skated this this morning. New uh, The Islanders practiced yesterday. Status quo there. Not a ton of ownership in this game. Um, Islanders top line, over 20,000 coming in with some positive leverage. Um The issue is, like, we talked about on the last slate with Gurgens, I call him Gurgle Shits. It's just much easier with Gurgle Shits on the top line with Thompson and Tuck. Like, he's a pretty good defensive player. Like, I think the Islanders' top line is fine in MME for this reason. Like, Buffalo is a good five on five team anyway. It's on their special teams where they get killed and the Islanders do have a good power play. So I think Islanders top line is a good MME play. I don't know if I can, you know, focus on them in single entry when you have teams like uh, Boston and going up against the Shark, Dallas and Jersey, um, even like that Ottawa Columbus game, you know what I mean? So, like 2.9 road totals, nothing to sneeze at, but there are higher road totals, including those coyotes that I just mentioned. You know what I mean? So I, I, I do like the Islanders top line. I think it would be for you know 20 max or so. The depth of the Islanders, like I, I just don't feel a need to go there on this slate. If it was like a five-game slate, sure, maybe I'll consider the second line or a Palmieri one-off or something like that. But uh with the plethora of games you can find better depth lines on the Buffalo side. I know we we talked up uh, the Skinner Paterka Krebs line. Their ice time is a big big concern. I don't know what Don Granado is doing, but he is pumping Cousins, Greenway, and Benson, and even Yost, Robinson, Olsen more. Like before Paterka scored that seventh goal of the night uh, for the Sabers in the third period, he was at nine minutes before he scored that goal. It is a big concern. So for that reason, I think I would go to Buffalo two cousins, Greenway Benson. If you want to go to the Islanders or the Buffalo top line, like that's fine. Thompson and tuck just because the Islanders also do struggle on the penalty kill. But like, since Patrick Watt has taken over, they are a very good defensive team. So really all in all, this is an MME game for me. I don't know if I'm going to focus on anything in my single entry lineup. Yeah, I, I think the point about the Islanders' defense under Patrick Waugh is, is the main point here. Since he took over, it's been almost two months now. Um, it'll be two months next, um, a week, next week, a week from today. Um, the Islanders lead the NHL for fewest expected goals against per 60 of five on five, like less than Dallas or Carolina or Vancouver, or any of those teams. Uh, actual goals against is sixth. But under two and less than teams like Seattle, less than Edmonton, less than Winnipeg, like they have been tremendous defensively. So 
it, you know, you not you you mentioned it. The Islanders, the their big weakness is the penalty kill. Their penalty kill has still been very bad under Patrick Watt. Like, let's you know, let's not get that twisted. Like, um, they have a very bad penalty kill. Um, you know, under Lane Lambert, and they still do under Watt. But you know, the Buffalo power play has been average at best, basically the entire season, and certainly uh, over the last uh, couple months. So, do I want to stack? the top Buffalo line, hoping that they can double dong on the power play like that. I, I think that's what you're kind of drawing to. So I'm going to be honest. I'm basic in single entry. I'm out on everything in this game. Um, as far as stacking goes, like if you want a one-off um, Tage Thompson, uh, if you want a one-off Dylan cousins, those types of things, I think that's fine. If I were to stack anything, I agree with you. It would be the Islanders top line Buffalo's penalty kill. Uh, it, it was kind of holding steady with really good goaltending, but uh, the goaltending's kind of gotten worse on the PK over the last couple or the last like six, eight weeks. And that's the one that's kind of the place that they can be had. And where the top line's perfectly correlated on the power play, that's where I'd want to go. Like I've, I'd feel more confident in, in saying the, I, I, I think the Islanders have a better chance of two power play goals here tonight than Buffalo does. Obviously, they're a lot more expensive. There's almost no ownership on them, 1.2% um, per the top stacks tools. So, uh, you know, not a lot of people are going to be playing them. But I think in single entry, I just don't have a lot of interest in full stacking a line on either side. If anything, it would be the Islanders' top line. But Buffalo's been really good at 5-on-5. Five five. You mentioned that. Their, their, um, their defense has been good. Ukapeka Lukanen has been great. Um, they don't take a ton of penalties. So the Islanders might only get two or three power plays anyway. Let's, it's Islanders one or bust, but I don't have interest in either side, really. Yeah, and the Barzell, Nelson, Horvat line obviously sounds good. They haven't been overly great at 5 on 5 anyway. They've been doing the damage on the power play, and they have a good power play. But like, if you're going to spend over 20000 for a line on this slate, you're going to want that 5 on 5 And you're probably not going to get it here. Let's go to another meat grinder game. Florida Panthers, they 2.7 total heading into Carolina. The Panthers have a 2.9. Looking at ownership in this game is pretty funny. The highest owned line is 0.2%. And that is Kachuk for Hagee Bennett. Like this. Uh, Bennett's out, by the way. Oh, yeah, Bennett's out. It's going to be uh, Lundell up there and then um, Lusterinen, Ocposo, and Evan Rodriguez on the third line. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, Anton Lundell up there doesn't really change much for anything really in this game for me it's an mme game like the carolina rangers game that was a, like those are the heavyweights of the east this is the heavyweights of the east one thing i will say florida takes a lot of penalties they have a very good penalty kill though if you want to you know one off a sveshnikov a one off a kuznetsov like kuznetsov isn't very expensive you want to one off jarvis you know carolina may get four or five opportunities here tonight i i just this is another one when we were talking about the rangers carolina like oh it, it could be like a 3-1 win with an empty net goal you know what i mean so like again if you get in, if these lines get into your crunches in mme i think that's fine but like in single entry I, it's hard for me to prioritize any form of stacking in this game yeah, I one I, I don't have a lot of interest in the Florida side for two reasons. One, um, obviously the Barkoff line is gonna get is gonna see a lot of um that Jordan Stahl shutdown line. Goals against numbers have been sliding a little, but it's basically just been all on the goaltenders, which is, you know, pretty much has been in Carolina all year. So like I'm not gonna worry about that too much. Carolina's penalty kill is great. And you know, Florida had that great comeback against Dallas the other night. But two out of the three goals were on the power play. Dallas gave them two power plays in the final 10 minutes of the game. Like, they kind of deserve to lose that if you're doing it at that point. I don't think Carolina is going to do that. I'm out on Florida one. Florida two would be the one that would interest me. I don't really like Anton Lundell, like, necessarily in that role. Uh, if you look at the expected goals numbers for Kachuk and Lundell, they have played 110, nearly 110 minutes together this season at five on five, 2.5 expected goals for like they're, they really haven't been generating a ton of quality shooting over 11%. It's a little bit high. It's nothing extreme and they could probably do that over a full season with a little bit of luck, but um, 
I don't want I don't want to rely on that going into Carolina. So I, I don't have a lot of interest in Florida. On the Carolina side, I'm going to be honest. I do have a little bit of interest in that top line for these reasons. One, Bennett out replaces him with um, Anton Lundell on that second line. Uh, Sam Bennett has been about league average by defensive metrics uh, so far this season, expected goals against metrics. Anton Lundell has been considerably worse. Um, and that line was about league average defensively as it was. Plus you have no Aaron Ekblad. Plus you have all the penalties. Like you mentioned the penalties, Florida's at 4.8 minor penalties taken per game over the last eight weeks. I think Arizona's at 4.7 and then no other teams above 4.1 or 4.2. Like it's those two teams way and above and uh, above everybody else. You know, Carolina's power play has been on a little bit of a struggle bus here lately. Um, you know, remember how hot they were around Christmas. Uh, that shooting percentage has definitely cooled off. But Aho and Sveshnikov, top power play unit, they've been playing a lot better at five on five, at least offensively, since the All Star break. Uh, with Tara Vine in next to them since the All Star break, uh, about 100 minutes, 3.9 expected goals, 3.2 actual goals per 60. Sveshnikov, 25 shots in his last eight games. Like one of the things that you and I have talked about a lot basically all season is that Sveshnikov wasn't shooting anywhere as close to what he's typically done for his career. Maybe he's starting to find that a little bit here as he, as they're, they're ramping up for playoffs. So you get two of the three guys on top power play. They're probably going to get a lot of power play time. Uh, the five on five line has been playing a lot better and they, they're not going to go out against the Barkov line because they don't take shutdown matchups at home. So they're going to get those second and third line matchups in Florida, which I think are, are, are easily the much better matchups to get. I'm not playing, like I say all that, and I'm not playing them here tonight. Like I'm not playing them in the single entry. But if I was 20 maxing, certainly 150 maxing, I would be kind of considering Carolina one here. I don't think the five on five matchup is that bad. They're playing very well right now, and they could get a lot of power play opportunities. I think there's some merit to Carolina one, but that's basically the only thing that I have real interest in for stacking in this game. Fair enough. And that is a pretty good point with Fondell's defensive metrics. Let's move on to – let's go from a defensive battle to an absolute gong show. Ottawa Senators with a 3.4 total. Heading into Columbus, the Blue Jackets have a 3.2 total. This game's an absolute mess. Like, I don't know, man. Like, the chalkiest lines of the night are Ottawa. And it just feels awful because they've been so bad recently. So I think I think this is what I would want to do, right? It, it, first of all, it's Kachuk, Pinto, Batherson, Stutzla, Giroux, Joseph. If you're worried about the Senators ruining your night and you still want to play them, just power play stack them. Just power play stack them. Go about your day. Columbus's penalty kill is awful. Um, like 14.4% projected ownership for the Pinto line, 12.5%. Projected ownership for the Stutzla Giroux line. It's just really high ownership. And I understand it's it's a really good matchup, right? But in our top stacks, as of this moment, like this, this could change. Like Pittsburgh at home against the Sharks is half the ownership. Now I think Pittsburgh is going to come up and maybe the Senators come down a little bit. But as it stands, I'd much rather play Pittsburgh than Ottawa here tonight. I, I think if I had to choose, it would be Pinto Kachuk. Just, you know, it's fine. But, like, I don't mind a power play stack here. It's just, you know, I'm looking to get a combination that isn't going to be super chalky, even if all the players on the power play have ownership. You know what I mean? So it would be a power play stack on Ottawa side. On the Columbus side, um, Chinnikov is out. There's a couple other people out. I don't even know who's slotting in on that third line. He's not in the DK player pool, so it doesn't really matter. It, it is Jenner, Gaudreau, Nylander, Marchenko, uh, Vronkov, Trey Fix, Solansky. I'm in on – my favorite line in this game on either side, honestly, is the Columbus top line. Now, we were talking a little bit about it before the show. The jenner gaudreau Rosovic line was very good offensively before Rosovic got traded because Rosovic was a shooter. And that's what Jenner and Gaudreau need. Yeah, Gaudreau's playmaking ability maybe is, you know, a little bit down from his Calgary days. Not shocking playing for Columbus, you know what I mean? But, like, Alex Nylander in the last game against Montreal had five shots on goal, five more attempts on net. He had ten attempts on net, 
five went wide or whatever, but he moved up fairly quickly once Chinnikov got um, hurt. This line's fully correlated. Ottawa is just a dumpster fire, and they're coming. And this Columbus top line is coming in half the ownership of either of the Ottawa lines. My fair line in this game is Columbus one. Yeah, um, I'll start on the Ottawa side. One thing I will say about Ottawa is like, yes, they do look bad, especially, but it a lot of it's been on defense. I know they haven't been scoring a lot of goals. Part of it's the power play. The power play has been a problem all season, and it's really weird because the power play was really good last year. Um, it was d- good the year before. It seemed like this was like the next big power play powerhouse, uh, along with New Jersey in the Eastern Conference to kind of take over, you know, Boston and Tampa Bay as those teams get older. But it's, it hasn't really worked out like that. At five on five, at least, a lot of their problems are just shooting percentage related. 6.3% over their last 15 games, is fourth worst in the NHL. Oddly enough, Chicago's last. I don't think that's a surprise. Pittsburgh's second last. I don't think that's a big surprise either. The team right below Ottawa is actually Florida at 6.1%. They're doing a lot of work on the power play. That's another one of the reasons I really don't like them here tonight. But when I see a team is struggling largely by shooting percentage, for shooting percentage concerns, like I don't worry about it that much. Eventually, it does get to be a problem. Like, look at the Los Angeles Kings. But, like, for, like, 15 games, like, it's not that big of a deal. It's it, – what you mentioned about the ownership is what kind of bothers me here. Um, 14.4% on the Ottawa top line, 12.5% on the Ottawa second line. And this this is a team on the road that's not scoring very well right now. Um, and you mentioned the – other, you know, like you said, there's a bunch of other lines – in that price range for Ottawa one that are more than playable. Pittsburgh is less than a thousand dollars more expensive. Dallas one is cheaper. Vegas one is cheaper. Um, Carolina one that we just talked about is cheaper. Both Toronto lines. I don't, we'll get to them. I'm not sure if I want to play them, but the Rangers top line also cheaper. Like, yes, they're coming in with lower top two stack percentages because Columbus is still Columbus, but a big part of Columbus's problem has been the penalty kill, right? Like that's where they're allowing a lot of their goals. If Ottawa, if Ottawa can't get going on the power play, it, it takes away a big weakness of this Columbus roster as far as goals against go. So I have no issue playing Ottawa one. Their expected goals aren't great with Bathurst in there, two and a half expected goals per 60, but they are scoring 3.7 goals per 60. You get two out of the three guys on the top power play unit. I'm not super concerned about the top line matchup um, against Columbus. going to be honest, I think I'd almost rather choke the chalk on Ottawa two. Because, like, yeah, maybe their power play gets there tonight. But I think the it's the five-on-five five matchups that particularly favor them, especially where we know, you know, Ottawa 2, 2.9 expected goals per 60 since January 1st. Like, they've actually been generating. Um, and he still gets still on the top power play, you know, in case it does go off. So I think it would be Ottawa 2. Like, Rosovic helped the top line from Columbus score well, but he also made them worse defensively. Like, that's kind of the trade-off you take with Rosovic. Um I'm not sure what Nylander does, but Columbus's top line's defensive numbers were a lot better without Roslovic. Now, the offensive numbers were worse. Again, that's the trade-off, but um, I think it's Ottawa, too, that I, I, I like best on the Ottawa side here. On the Columbus side, I think I'm with you on the top line for the main reason, like, the Ottawa top line is just bad defensively. Oh, my God. Like, I like Shane Pinto as, a, as an offensive player, and he's going to be very useful for us in DFS for a long, long time, or as long as DFS is around. Um, he's not good defensively. <laughs> like, that's, like, I don't know what to say. Um, that Ottawa top line, uh, 62 shot attempts allowed per 60 minutes. Um, not a big sample to work with with expected goals yet, but they are uh, giving up quite a bit. I do like Columbus one uh, in this matchup, but I think Ottawa two, despite all that ownership, is my favorite line in this game. All I all I can think about is like this game. This game looks like a headache. If it, it just it just feels like one of those games where if you stack it, it's a two one shootout game, and if you don't stack it, it's going to be a seven five or both goalies get pulled. You know what I mean? Um, but it's Ottawa two for me, uh, and then Columbus one. Well, the good news is it from a mental standpoint, it is a lot easier to click in fifteen percent Timmy Stutzel and Claude Giroux than eighteen percent Nick Foligno from Tuesday. <laughs> Yeah, and those of us that didn't click them in are paying for it. Very much. That was ridiculous. <sighs> Arizona Coyotes. 
with a three total. <laughs> Heading into Detroit, the Wings have a 3.6 total. This game sucks, too. Like, Arizona's lost 14 in a row. Well, they had lost 14 in a row. Oh, yeah. And then they, they turned it, but they've only lost four of their last seven. <laughs> so they're turning things around in a big way. I didn't say anything on Hayton. I still think he's out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Detroit going with some weird ass lines that I have no interest in. Like, Detroit has a 3.6 total here. And it's just like, make a playable line. Like, just bring Jeff Blasshill back at this point. Jesus Christ. Like Raymond Comfort Perron, Perron, top line winger in 2024. Like he's having a terrible season, not like a Chandler Stevenson terrible season, but yeah, like a terrible Chandler Stevenson type season. So like, I don't want to play that line. Like they separated to bring Cat and Kane and that's just a problem. Like if you want a power play stack, you're going across lines and like, Maybe you got to consider Raymond Confer Perron as a filler. I, I don't know. They're 12K. Like the all the Detroit lines here are 12K. I, I just don't want to play them. I'd rather play Arizona here. Um, Arizona's a little bit more expensive, like Keller Schmaltz, Bukestad, 16 7, but they're coming in with positive leverage. I don't mind them. Kraus, Genther, Cooley around their top two stack percentage at 13 6. Like, I don't mind them. Michelli one off is fine, but like you know, I mean, like I think I'd rather just play Arizona one or two than try to figure out these Detroit lines and who's going to score. It's kind of like a Seattle conundrum. Like Detroit's just a way worse version of Seattle. It's like yeah, they have a huge total, but who's going to score? Like all these lines suck. So I'm I, I kind of like Arizona on this side, but like this game scares me more than the Ottawa Columbus game somehow. Now, Arizona's definitely had some really bad games. I think what should be highlighted is that it was basically all – it's basically all related to their penalty kill. Um, if you look at uh, their goals against – I was looking at their goals against the 5-on-5 five five, um, over the last month. Now, 21st in the league, obviously that's not great, but they're only .1 goals against per 60 higher than Boston, right? Um, they fewer goals against than you know, certainly Detroit, um, Tampa Bay, New Jersey, Washington, Vegas, like lower goals against than those teams. All their problems, um, kind of like Columbus that we just talked about, all their problems have come on the penalty kill. Now, Detroit's power play at times has been very, very good this season. Um, Arizona is taking a lot of penalties, 4.1 minor penalties per game taken over the last eight weeks. Uh, Detroit is above average by drawing power plays. So theoretically, it is a good power play matchup for the Red Wings. The problem is, is if you're playing Detroit, you kind of have to focus on the power play guys, right? Because Arizona, like I said, Arizona's Achilles heel has been the penalty kill. If you look at their power play, um, set up from the last game. You have Lucas Raymond on the from the top line. Um, you have Alex DeBrincat and Robbie Fabry from the second line, and Patrick Kane from the third line. So you have the top power play unit spread across three lines. The only line and the only lines, the only line with two guys on it on the top power play unit is centered by Andrew Kopp. So <laughs> it's, it's like, what, what do you do here? Just to kind of hammer home that point, Cop and DeBrincat on the ice together this season, 1.4 expected goals per 60 minutes of five on five. I'm pretty sure Zach Hyman had a higher total by himself in the MT game last night. <laughs> um, that's the one line that I would <laughs> that I would have interest in is the Andrew Cop, Robbie Fabry, Alex DeBrincat line. Because you do get two guys on the top power play unit, Arizona's penalty kill has been very bad. Like, over the last month, the only team giving up um, more goals against per 60 on the penalty kill than Arizona is Anaheim, and the two teams are neck and neck. Um, Arizona's PK has been genuinely very, very bad. How good can this Detroit power play be 
is it enough uh, to make me want to stack them? Now, here's where I'll say at least they're cheap, right? At 12600 for Cop, Fabry, and the Brink Hat, uh, they're a filler line. You don't, you know, you don't need four goals or like three goals and a couple shot bonuses or something to reach value. You probably only need like two goals and, you know, maybe a shot bonus from the brain cat or something like that. And then you're kind of laughing. Um, so in that sense, they're fine, but it's like, do I want to put my D- uh, 12 game slate? Do I want to put my DFS night in the hands of Andrew cop? And it's like, not really. Like the brain cat one off is fine. Certainly a Robbie Fabry one off is fine. Patrick Kane and all that stuff. I just don't know if I can get around to stacking. I do like the Arizona side better. Clayton Keller with Nick Bukestad is kind of interesting because they've actually been able to control the play when they're on the ice. They just don't create a lot of offense, which is kind of a hallmark of a Nick Bukestad line. Um, shooting percentage is a little bit out of control, but what I will say is that Bukestad played over 20 minutes in that last game. Um, when they, I think they were in Minnesota and they lost 4-1. Yeah. Bukestad was over 20 minutes, even though he's not on the top power play unit. So a lot of ice time um, for that top line. But I wrote up Lawson Krause, Dylan Genther, Logan Cooley. Like, JT Koffer, I think, is a decent defensive center uh, for Detroit. But once you get past that, like, what are you really looking at? Uh, like, you're looking at Andrew Kopp and you're looking at Joe Valeno. You're looking at Joe Valeno and Patrick Kane on the same line. You get Like, there's just nothing to prevent them. Um, I wrote up, as I mentioned, I wrote up uh, that Arizona line uh, in the picks article couple things a lot more ice time lately Cooley and Genther over 16 20 at over 16 20 per game in their last five games Cooley was under 14 20 in the 15 games before that so he's getting a lot more power play time uh and Detroit is terrible terrible at five on five 28th um by expected goals against per 60 at five on five since the all-star break and dead last by actual goals against per 60 Genther's on the top power play unit. These guys are getting more ice time. Cooley and Genther have been kind of rolling together. I'm not worried about any matchups at any strengths for them. Arizona 2 is what I like best in this game. I think the cop line from Detroit is playable. This is about where we're at with five weeks left in this season. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know if I'll ever full stack that Andrew cop line, but yeah, taking like Fabry to bring cat two man's fine i worry about ice time but like it's priced in right like if fabry plays like 12 minutes it's priced in so yeah like the ducks are also on the slate so maybe i'd rather just attack that penalty kill but the like you said detroit's way cheaper so yeah that game's a mess. Sign up using the link in the chat to get access to the best NHL data and tools in the industry. You get player and ownership projections, top stacks, tools, line combinations, and access to the premium Discord, which is invaluable in my opinion, especially with Daily Deposit Frost back in there, giving his goalie locks of the night, which means whatever he tells you is he's locking, you just stack against. And there you go. Like it's Sometimes you overcomplicate things, all you got to do is stack against his goal. I will say he had Magnus Corona the other night who lost, but he was under under 7K and still got almost 20 DK points. So good for Frostback. Um, but I will be stacking against his goalie tonight. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Boston Bruins with a 3.4 total heading into Montreal. The Canadiens have a 2.5 total. Oh, boy. Here's the, here's the, here we go with the Bruins. Like, I just, I just don't like these Bruins lines. I haven't liked them all season. Now, the issue is Marsha and Coyle DeBrusque is co- fully correlated and they're going to avoid the Su- uh, Suzuki line. The issue with that is, what, like, leaving Pasternak off a power play stack just feels miserable. So, like, at that point, do you just full power play stack the Bruins here? Like, maybe. Like, a pasta knock one off, always fine. Like, Zaka's on the second power play unit. Heinen's not even on either unit. And they're getting 8% ownership right around their two, top two stack. The second line, Marshan Coyle, DeBrusque, 15 8%, 3.3% ownership. Like, I like Boston, too, because they're fully cor- correlated. They're going to avoid the Suzuki line. They get the Montreal PK, which is awful. But you're leaving 
Pasternak off a power play stack at that point. So either you include him or you just try to thread the needle because it is a good five on five matchup. I lean more towards power play stacking uh, just because it's not overly expensive. On the Montreal side, it's not the best matchup by any means here. Um, someone's out sick. Oh, Shattenkirk. I think that helps them defensively, honestly. So I, if Montreal 1 gets into your crunches at 20 lineups, that's fine. Like, I don't think I'm going to prioritize stacking them on this slate. If you want to have like a one-off new hook, I think that's fine. But really, this is a Boston game for me. Yeah, the, the problem with Montreal is just that there are other – I mean – Boston's not a great matchup for them regardless, but there are just other lines in that price range that I'd rather play. We'll talk about Vegas uh, later in the show. Um, you know, obviously Ottawa's uh, in play. We're going to talk about Pittsburgh a little bit later. There are just other, you know, we mentioned Carolina earlier in the show. Like there are just other lines that I would rather play. Um, and we also mentioned how uh, Boston's better defensively when they split up Pasternak and Marchand, like the Pasternak line is up to 65 minutes, not a huge sample, but six, only 1.9 expected goals against per 60. Like that's a pretty tough matchup for the Suzuki line. So I, I, I don't have a lot of interest in stacking the Montreal side on the Boston side. I kind of agree with you. Like I don't mind Marchand coil at DeBrusque. They're not playing particularly well. Um, I was looking at their numbers since January 1st. So we're up to two and a half months now. Um, shots for 22 per 60, shots against 31. Yeah. Like they're only carrying about 41% of the shots that are on the ice. That's not good. Uh, what is helping them is they're shooting 15%, which is absurd. Um, I think I would kind of lean to the Pasternak line here. But the problem is, like, you do want to attack the Montreal PK, right? So I think I would probably be more comfortable, like, stacking across the lines, like Pasternak, Zaka, Marchand or something like that. Like, I know Marchand, Coyle, and DeBrusque are perfectly correlated on the power play. I don't have particular interest in playing Charlie Coyle or Jake DeBrusque here. Like, it's it's Marchand, it's, it's Pasternak, and then probably Pavel Zaka. So, like, stacking across the lines, making sure you get at least two guys in the power play – and at least one of them is David Pasternak is probably the approach here. So it is the Boston side that I do favor. Um, it is a 3.4 total, which I think is the second highest road total on the slate. And like, there is not a lot of ownership coming on. Like you mentioned 8% for the top line, 3% for the second line. Like that's not a lot, even on a 12 game slate for the second highest road total uh, here tonight. So I do have interest in the top six from Boston. It's just, figuring out how exactly you want to stack them. I would say no matter what I do, if I'm playing Boston here tonight, Pasternak is in my lineup and Marchand is in my lineup. It's just figuring out, do I want to put a center with them? Do I want to put a cheap winger like Heinen or something like that with them? Do I want to put Charlie McAvoy on the blue line? It'd be Pasternak and Marchand that I make sure I have there because Montreal penalty kill still bad and Montreal still taking a lot of penalties, 3.9 minor penalties per game. Over the last eight weeks, it's like eighth in the league or something like that. So um, I do like the Boston side better here. I do like the Boston top six. It's just figuring out exactly what I want to stack. All I know is that Pasternak is 100% in my Boston lineups. Brad Marchand probably in as well. And then it's just figuring out if I want to put anybody else with them. Yeah, if you're not into Boston too, I think the one thing I would do would be just Pasternak McAvoy and go about my day. You want to add in Marchand to that. Do it up. San Jose Sharks. <laughs> 2.3 total heading into Pittsburgh. The Penguins, oh my God, have a 3.7 total. This is another one of those games where it's just like, why? Why does this exist? Why is this so much pain? Not, not as bad as breaking down the Blues Coyotes for the 19th straight day in 2020. But close. Crosby, Rust, Bunting, 19.6, 7.2% ownership. I think that comes up during the day. Like, it's going to come up. Fully correlated against the Sharks. I know they didn't have a great game the other night, but, like, Bunting shooting, 
Crosby and Rust have good numbers all season. And the Sharks are atrocious. It's maybe not a hyperbole to say, well, I mean, maybe they aren't the worst team by far anymore, but like they're the worst team in the NHL. I like Pittsburgh one here. It does make me nervous to play them in single entry, but like sometimes nerves are good. <laughs> Getting co- too comfortable with your lineup, sometimes you get complacent. And like I seriously have to consider Pittsburgh one here. Now, Pittsburgh two at 2.9% is interesting. Like you don't really stack Pittsburgh for the power play anyway, because their power play is just terrible. Like Malkin and Smith at least are competent together and they're going to get, you know, second and third line matchups for the sharks. And like EC, ECHL teams could put out better second and third lines defensively. You know what I mean? So like, I don't mind the middle six of Pittsburgh. I think Pittsburgh one is my favorite line. It makes me nervous because Pittsburgh is one of these teams that just like they say they want to make the playoffs, but do they? You know what I mean? On the Sharks side, like the Granlin Zetterlin Barabanov line at 12K is at least interesting. Like, do I want to, do I really want to play negatively leverage Michael Granlin? Not really, but like, does Pittsburgh scare me at all? No. So, like, I, I would give some thought to Saint, uh, San Jose 1. I'll let you talk about Eklund Zadina. Like, Zadina had a couple power play goals uh, the other night. The, the Malkin Smith O'Connor line isn't very good defensively. So, it's just like you kind of got to consider both sides here. And it's just like it just leaves a really bad taste in my mouth. Yeah, you do have to consider both sides here. And that's why I absolutely love this game. Um, I'll start on the Pittsburgh side. So, I mentioned the Pittsburgh top. Well, I wrote about the Pittsburgh top line in the picks article. And what I mentioned is like, yes, obviously <laughs> Pittsburgh's not playing very well right now. Uh, that's why they're not going to make the playoffs. But San Jose last by uh, expected goals against per 60 uh, at five on five since the all-star break 31st by actual goals against per 60. The main point of what I wrote about in the article is that Russ and Crosby have over 110 minutes together at five on five without Jake Gensel on the wing this season. Cause he was injured before he got traded. Remember um, in that time, 3.8 expected goals per 60, almost 42 shots per 60. That is a lot of offensive generation. The actual goal scoring is closer to league average, just a little bit above it. Cause they only shot 6% as a line or as a duo without Gensel. Pittsburgh is a low percentage team. So, it's not shocking that they're at 6%, but I suspect that a Crosby line would be higher than that, even without Getzel over a bigger sample. So I, I, I mean, I like Pittsburgh one here. Um, you're right. Bunting uh, top line playing minutes uh, on that top line uh, with Crosby and with, uh, geez, uh, <laughs> with <laughs> rust. Oh my God. Brain fart. Um, one could say Bunting, your brain is a bit rusty. <laughs> yeah. Bunting, uh, three shots, four shots, four shots in his three games with Pittsburgh, at least 18 minutes in every game. No matchup concerns on the San Jose side. Like the top line has, you know, below average numbers defensively. And it's the best defensive line that they have. So, like, I'm, like, I'm not worried about any matchup concerns. And you mentioned the ownership. Like, we looked on Tuesday in the $15 on DK when Pittsburgh uh, was at home or was in Ottawa, sorry. So it's a little bit different. Like being in Ottawa and home to San Jose is different, but in Ottawa, Crosby was under 6% in the, in the big $15 on DK. So like, I, yeah, maybe it's higher than 7% in a, in a, but in a large field MME, like the $15 or the $5 or whatever, like, is it going to be like nine, 10% at the most, like me probably. And I, I think that's perfectly fine when you're playing the sharks. Like I do like Pittsburgh one here. I like them more than the depth. The, the reason is um, Malkin. <laughs> He's just not doing a whole lot. He has 10 shots in his last 10 games. Uh, 23 shots in his last 15 games overall. Like, he's just not shooting the puck. Uh, that worries me because then you're relying on guys like Joe O'Connor and, and Riley Smith, and they can do it. So, like, I don't have a problem with playing Pittsburgh too, but I think I'd rather play Pittsburgh one, just get the best player on the team in your lineup in a good matchup. The San Jose side... 
I did write up about <laughs> write up Philip Zadina uh, in the picks article today. Philip Zadina in 27 games since January 1st is at 10 shots per 60 minutes at five on five. That's kind of a barometer that I look at for a player and heavy shot volume. Like his 10 shots per 60 of five on five is top 20 in the league and high in over the last three and two and a half months and higher than guys like William Nylander, Nikolai Ehlers, Timo Meyer, Tage Thompson, Travis Konechny, Carter Verhage. That's a lot. And what I mentioned uh, in the, in the article about Zadina and his ice time is that he's been over 15 minutes um, in each of his last nine games, averaging almost 17 minutes. So it's not like he's playing 11 or 12 minutes anymore. He's getting pseudo top line minutes, like high end second line minutes. And him and Eklund um, together this season have actually been pretty good together. Uh, 2.8 expected goals uh, per 60 at five on five, where the team average has been 2.2. And the league average is about 2.5. And Pittsburgh's expected goals against since the All-Star break is 27th in the league, 25th by actual goals against. The second line doesn't, you know, matching up against Vulcan doesn't worry me defensively. Now, even matching up against Crosby doesn't really worry me defensively at this point of the season. I do like Pittsburgh won the best in this game, and they do grade out the best for me by quite a bit. But, you know, San Jose 2, uh, under 10K, uh, 2.5% ownership, I don't think it's that bad. I'd be more inclined to like one off Zadina or one off Eklund because Eklund's on the top power play unit than I would be to full stack them. But I think there's some juice here to San Jose too if you need to save some money. Yeah, I honestly don't even mind San Jose too. Like I never thought I'd utter those words this season, but like just because like Eklund without Hurdle had been so bad, but like Zadina with Eklund has actually been pretty good. So. I'm I'm kind of a Zadina truther. Um, yeah. You know, I I like to try to find these guys that are undervalued. I I honestly think Zadina is a good NHLer. I just don't think he like going from Detroit and now going to San Jose has been good for his development. But I mean, that's something for another story for another day. I mean, he got Jeff Blasshold really hard. Not shocking. New York Rangers with a three total heading into Tampa Bay. The Lightning also have a three total. Igor, <laughs> he's been on quite a tear since the All-Star break. That's the Igor that we know and love. Um, will he have bad games between now and the end of the season? Yes. But he looks to be back. Kucherov with Point and Hagel. Stamkos with Sorelli and Duclair. Uh, Paul with Esamont and Shiri. Rangers status quo here. This is an interesting, like, again, I'm kind of confused, not like confused because these, these uh, top lines or the checking lines that go out against the Rangers, they kind of split their time between the Zabanjad and Panarin line. Now you don't really see too much of a hard match because like we've talked about this so many times. You probably know what I'm even going to say. Like, yeah, the point with Hagel and Kucherov, they're good defensively. Sorelli and Stamkos do not work together. They haven't. They never will. There's a sample across seasons, and adding Duclair to that line is not going to help. He, it might help offensively, but defensively, black hole season. So, like, I do have some interest in the Rangers here. Specifically that top line, because if you want to pay 20900 for Churchek, Panera, and Lafreniere in MME, I think that's fine. But like in single entry, and we'll talk about Minnesota with their three wing top line, which is a bit annoying. Like it would hard, it would be hard for me to prioritize the Rangers second line here instead of the Minnesota top line in single entry. But the Rangers top line, Kreider, Zabanjad, Roslovic at 17-3, possibly seeing a fair bit of that Sorelli, Stamkos, Declare line interests me. And like, we just talked about it with Columbus. Roslovic made that Jenner Gaudreau line good offensively. And whether you want to admit it, if you're if you hate the Rangers or not, Zabanjan and Kreider are better than Gaudreau and 
Janet. They're having bad seasons. Zaban Janet specifically a five on five, but like the numbers with Rosovic in a small sample are very good. And let's not pretend that Tampa Bay is elite defensively. In fact, they're maybe average. So I do have interest in New York one. On the Tampa side, I don't have a ton of interest. Like that top line is the most expensive on the night at 22-7. If you get there a little bit in MME, I think that's fine. Like Sorelli, Stamkos, Duclair, like maybe they'll be okay offensively, but like Sorelli and Stamkos have never been okay offensively. It's like a one-off Duclair is fine, I guess, or like a one-off Esamont, but like I don't think I'll be stacking anything on the Tampa side. Yeah, I kind of agree with you uh, about not stacking Tampa. Like, I really do love the top line. You you know I'm the biggest Brandon Hagel head uh, on the planet. Um, since the All-Star break with Hagel on the top line, they're at 3.2 expected goals per 60, 4.4 actual goals per 60. Like, they've been very, very good. Problem is, so is Igor. <laughs> like, that's... That's, that's kind of the issue here is the Rangers penalty kill was kind of one of their weaknesses um, throughout the season. Off of it now it's, elite. <laughs> it's well, I wouldn't go that far, but it has been a lot better. Um, even before Truba got hurt, um, it was, a, it was improving anyway, it has been a lot better. So, you know, I think it takes a little bit of the power play threat away from Tampa. The merit to play the lightning here tonight is that they're the pivot away from uh, Tampa Bay. The way I look at it, though, is like if if I want to go get a 1% owned, an expensive 1% owned line, I'd probably just go play Panarin, Trocek, and Lafreniere instead. You know what I mean? Like Vasilevsky has been, pardon my language, dog shit for – Basically, since he returned, like he's had good games, obviously, but on the whole, he has not been good whatsoever. Like part of Tampa Bay's defensive issues is that Vasilevsky can't save the puck. Um, so even if Tampa does have a good defensive game, like the Rangers, like that Rangers line could score like three goals on five shots. You know what I mean? Like it's just that's how bad Vasilevsky's been. So that's kind of the problem I have here with Tampa is like that Rangers top line is eighteen hundred dollars cheaper coming in with less ownership. So if, you know, if you're really looking for a low online, they're coming in with less ownership. And these are basically polar opposite goalies right now. <laughs> like over the last six weeks, sturkin has been a, a, probably the best in the league. And over the last six weeks, Vasilevsky has been arguably the worst. Like it's, that's just kind of the way that I look at it. So if, if of the expensive lines, I'd rather play Rangers too. But I agree with you. It's the Rangers' top line. I I I would rather play. I call them the top line. I, they're not really the top line they're anymore. Not. This is this is our Temi Panarin's team now. But uh, Kreider's advantage at Rosvik, like you said, really good numbers in a small sample. Three point two expected goals per sixty, but just over thirty minutes together. What I will say is like Rosvik's playing, like he's played between fourteen and seventeen minutes in the three games. So it's not like. You know, Tarasenko, we talked about Florida earlier. Tarasenko's played like 12 and 13 minutes in the first two games with the Panthers. Like, that's a little bit of a problem. If you can play like 16 minutes, like, that's fine. Um, Spanish had 13 shots in the three games uh, with Rosovic. And even though they might match up against the Hegel line, which has been pretty good defensively, again, Vasilevsky's been a, a, a complete sieve. So uh, I, I think I like the Kreider line the best in this game. And then I and then Rangers too, probably nothing for me from the Tampa side. Yeah, um, yeah. Toronto Maple Leafs. I had nothing to add there, really. Toronto Maple Leafs, the three point three total heading into Philadelphia. The Flyers have a three point one. Oh boy, like. The, the leaves, gotta love the leaves. Um, going with Matthews, Bertuzzi, Yonkrock, Nylander, Tavares, Domi, McMahon, Nyes, Kampf. Flyers, supposedly, going Katorier, Brank, Gurianoff, Konechny, Tippett, Lawton, Paling, Hathaway, Cates, and Fairby, Forrester, Frost. <sighs> I'm not sure what Sheldon Keith is doing. Um, 
I don't particularly love these lines together. Like Tavares, Domi, Nylander seems pretty decent offensively, but they're going to get run the fuck over defensively. Matthews, Bertuzzi, Yarncroc, like Matthews and Yarncroc last season with Marner. Not good. And very slow pace for a Matthews line. I have interest in the in the Flyers here. I just wish that these lines were a little bit better. As it is, I'll play Lawton, connect me, tip it. I'll get over my Lawton, clicking in Scott Lawton thing. Like, he's actually decent for DFS. I'll give him that. It's just Scott Lawton. You know what I mean? But, like, with connect me and tip it, tip it is honestly has probably been my favorite mid range one off all season. The dude just does nothing but shoot the puck. Connect me is their best player. Lawton's fine. Like, at this point, you can change his name to Sean Couturier, and it's probably the same thing. Like, Couturier has been bad. So I, I like that Konechny, Lott, and Tippett line. You want to play Forrest or Faraby Frost, I think that's fine as well. Matthews one-off, obviously fine. I just do not like these Toronto lines at all. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. <laughs> like, Matthews has actually has 80 minutes played this season without Marner or Nylander on his line, and I don't think it would – surprise anybody to hear that the offensive numbers are I mean for Matthews are not very good um, 59 shot attempts per 60 uh, with Matthews on the ice without those wingers 2.8 expected goals for 3.2 against like they're actually getting um, the worst end of the shot quality uh, 3.2 actual goals which is good for most players like really good for most players it's not that good for a Matthews any anything with the Matthews line uh, 2.9 goals against like the offense gets worse and the defense gets worse. Um, the second line, like Tavares and Domi have 60 minutes together, 2.9 expected goals against per 60 for them as well. Like, I know we like to make fun of Marner a lot. He's probably their best defensive forward. And, and, and on top of that, he's a world-class playmaker who can create high, uh, high percentage shots for his line mates. You take all that out of the lineup. It changes a lot. Like, other than Matthews, I think he's the one guy they cannot afford to lose, right? So um, I, d- I just don't have interest in stacking Toronto here. Uh, like the prices are reasonable. There's not much ownership coming in on them, 5 to 6%. But honestly, even at, the, at those prices, I, I just don't have a lot of interest beyond – like I, Austin Matthews one-off is always in play. William Nylander one-off is always in play. Like those types of things, I'm perfectly fine with. I'm just talking about like full stacking. I don't think I can get on board. I, I, I kind of agree. It's the flyer side that I like better. I did notice they did not send out Scott Lawton against the top line from the Sharks when they played against San Jose, which is pretty interesting to me <laughs> for this reason, is that if he's not going out against Matthews, and yes, Matthews' defense has been worse, but you kind of want to avoid that. If he's going to go out against Max Domi and William Nylander, that's great. If he goes out against the third line instead, hello, David Camp. That's even better. So, like, I think I'm kind of with you. Like, I really do like um, that Tippett, Konechny, uh, Lawton line here. You know, Konechny and Lawton, 3.8 goals per 60 together at 5 on 5 and 140 minutes together. Shooting percentage under 11%. So like it's a, you know, 10.9% shooting is high, but it's not one of those, oh my God, this is going to crash. It's going to be like, maybe it comes down to like 10, 10 and a half percent. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I, I kind of like that line quite a bit here. Uh, not coming in with a lot of ownership, 3.4%, 5% top two stack percentage. And just to compare them to Toronto, like they're basically in line for top two stack percentage with the Matthews line and coming in with... Uh, a, a fair bit less ownership when you're looking at those low ownership rates. So one-offs for me from the Toronto side, if I'm going to stack anything, it's going to be that Tippett connect me lot in line uh, from the Flyers. Yep. Um, we have MMA this weekend. It is a, not a pay-per-view card. It's in the apex, but I will be recording my MMA video tonight. It will be going up on my Twitter after NHL locks So make sure to check out that. You can get MMA Sims, which I will put the link to below the video. And, yeah, check it out. Appreciate the support. 
New Jersey Devils with a 2.8 total. Heading into Dallas, the Stars have a 3.7. Did we? We didn't. We didn't get uh, Devils lines while we we're on the show, did we? No. No. I mean, I'll go double check, but no, I didn't see anything. Yeah. So we were we were kind of estimating what they were going to be, and we think that Heisher and Meyer are going to be together, and Hall and Hughes will be together because Jack Hughes is probably the worst face-off center <laughs> ever. So no. I, I'll just say um, the lines that are in top stacks, Hisher, Hughes, Mercer, looks like that's what they're going to start with because they did have practice yesterday and that's what they went with. And then Brad Hall and Meyer uh, was the second line. So it looks like the lines we have in top stack are the right ones. Um, as, as always, once New Jersey starts getting their brains beat in, things will change. Yeah, I don't know why they would do that. Like, I don't know why they would separate Heischer and Meyer, but a lot of the things the Devils do don't make any sense. So, like, if you want to play Heischer, Hughes, Mercer, go for it. But, like, they don't have any – well, like, Nemich and Hughes are pretty good puck-moving defensemen. But, like, after that, they got no one to move the puck. They're – I don't know, man, like – I feel like they're going to be in their own zone a lot tonight. And I, I like Dallas here. You want to play the top line. That's perfectly fine. They're fully correlated. Um, Devils penalty kill. Not great. Jake Allen making his debut. So, like Siegenthaler is out. Hamilton's out. Uh, now Marino's out. Their blue line is a mess. You want to play that top line. I think that's fine. 5.5%. They are extremely efficient. But again, for me, I'm going to that third line, Johnson, Stankov, and Ben. They're coming in with a little bit more ownership than the top line, 6.4%, but they're 13,900, and 6.4% uh, is perfectly fine for me. There's bad chalk, and then there's 6.4% Stankov against the Devils, and I like that. You want to go to the Duchesne Marchman two-man, that's fine as well. Sam Steele doesn't do too much for me, but it is Dallas three for me, then Dallas one than some sort of New Jersey, assuming they keep the lines together. Yeah. Um, Hughes and Hisher playing together is, is always interesting to me because those guys don't play a lot together, but when they do, they do tend to generate a lot of offense. Which isn't which shocking. I yeah, which isn't shocking. Um, the problem is, is like, is Hughes playing injured? Like we talk about that basically every show that we do, that we have uh, New Jersey. It is a concern to think about. Um and, you know, the Dallas top line, their defensive numbers have been getting better. I was looking earlier since the All-Star break. They're down to 2.4 expected goals against per 60 at 5-on-5. Plus, you get Haskin and Harley behind them. Plus, you have Tanev and Lindell. Like, um, there are uh, some pretty good – there are some pretty good defensive pairs uh, for the Stars there now. So, um, I think Hughes, Hisher, and Mercer, especially where they're under 20K, it's like – if it was this time last year, a Hughes Hisher Mercer line might be like twenty three thousand dollars. You know what I mean? That's that's just kind of the thing that I think about. Um, I don't mind them here. The thing is, is like they're at nineteen thousand five hundred. They are obviously very expensive, and there are just other lines, like New Jersey on the road in Dallas or Pittsburgh at home against San Jose. Like I know Pittsburgh and New Jersey. Actually, I mean. New <laughs> New Jersey sucks too, but um, sorry. Uh, that's just kind of the way that I look at it. Like, I think there are just other lines that I would rather play. Like, if you want to play them instead of playing a, a super chalky Ottawa, like, I think that's fine. Um, if you want to play them instead of uh, going with the super low-owned Islanders, I think that's fine. But I just think with Pittsburgh sitting right there, like, it, it just makes it an easy decision for me. Uh, it's more the Dallas side that I am interested in. Like, no, no Hamilton and no Marino and no Siegenthaler might take the three best defensemen out of this lineup. I know Ham uh, Marino's had a little bit of a rough stretch this season, but he's generally been pretty good um, throughout his NHL career. I wrote up why Johnson in the picks article, like he's only gone one game without a point since Logan Stankov <laughs> Stankoven's been called up. Uh, with those two on the ice, they're at four expected goals, 4.8 actual goals for 60 minutes. Um, Johnson skated at least 17 minutes um, in all those games. So, you know, they're definitely getting ice time. 
not super concerned about any of the New Jersey matchups, especially where Hughes uh, and Hisher are now playing together uh, on the same line. That doesn't, there's just not a lot left in their depth, right? Like I think Holland Brack can kind of be good defensively. That's basically it. And even then, like his year and Hughes don't have good defensive numbers. They just have really good offensive numbers together. So I'm kind of with you uh, on that line. 6.4% ownership is a little bit high, but they're still under 14K, playing extremely well. Um, it's not a great power play matchup for them, but you know, you're know you not stacking that line for their power play correlation anyway. It's Johnston, Stankoven, uh, and Ben that I like best in this game. I'm kind of interested in Hughes, Hisher, and, and Mercer, but I think that'd be more MME for me than single entry. Yeah, and, you know, Nemich might be their best defensive defenseman now, which is insane because he's a rookie. Like once 19, you get A 19-year-old rookie and on top yeah. of that. You get past that top pair, there is nothing home for the Devils. Just me and you basically could be the third pair. Anaheim Ducks with a 2.4 total heading into Minnesota. The Wild have a 3.7. Joe Erickson Eck is out. Ryan Hartman moves up to the top line. Marat Kuznetsdinov. I don't know. I probably butchered that. But, like, with MMA, I have the the OV and the EV last names pretty down pat. That, that one's pretty difficult. He is making his debut in between Felino and Gaudreau. That is probably going to be a checking line. They're 8,100, 2.7% projected ownership. You know, whatever. I the interest here obviously is Minnesota one. Kaprizov, Baldy, Hartman fully correlated against the Anaheim PK. They just got manhandled by the Chicago power play. Manhandled. Bedard had his first five point game. It was like it was ridiculous. Nick Felino had like forty DK points in twenty twenty four. The issue here is they're fully they're they're all wings. So you'd have to play a double center line somewhere. Not really a huge deal if you find one. They are 21-2, coming in with a lot of positive leverage. The second line, Zuccarell, Rossi, Johansson, coming in more owned than the top line because the top line's three wings, right? That seems a bit funky, but again, it's the depth of the Ducks. So, like, Zuccarello for the top power play is fine. Like, Rossi and Johansson, they pr probably play 15, 16 minutes against nothing. So, like, I guess it makes sense. But I'd rather... Um, play the top line for sure. On the duck side, like if a Toronto Terry Strom get into my crunches, sure, I'll leave it. But other than that, like maybe a McTavish one off, but I'm really not interested in the ducks tonight. Yeah, I have no interest in Anaheim. Um, I'm kind of with you. Like, if, I'm more on like if you want to one off somebody, um, like. One off Frank for Toronto, I think is playable, but he's pretty expensive uh, on DK. Like he's still 6,800. You know what I mean? And like, if you want off Frank for Toronto at 6,800, Clayton Keller's cheaper. Jonathan Marsh so cheaper. Owen Tippett and Travis Konechny are both cheaper. Like that's kind of the problem. Um, the Minnesota side's obviously the clear side that I like best. Here's what I'll say. I mean, two things. One, Hartman and Kaprizov don't have good offensive numbers together. Like, there's a reason why Joel Erickson Eck was put on. Like, they don't want to play Joel Erickson Eck on the top line. They were holding off on that for as long as they could because he's such a good checking shutdown center. They put him there because Marco Rossi wasn't really doing the job on the top line. And Ryan Hartman, you know, 2021 is a long time ago now. It's been a couple of years since he's been any good on the top line. Um, you're just stacking them for the power play, right? So, honestly, I. I Think Minnesota one is perfectly fine. Eleven point one percent against a twenty six point nine percent top two stack percentage. They're mostly fine because of the power play correlation. Um, the Ducks are taking the second most minor penalties per game uh, of any team in the league over the last eight weeks. That Florida was the only team higher. Minnesota drawing a lot of power plays. Four point two power play off or four point two minor penalties drawn per game. That's third most in the league over the last eight weeks. So they could get a lot of power plays here tonight. Those are the reasons why you play them. But if it gets to that point, it'd be one of those things like maybe I take out Hartman and put in Zuccarello. Or maybe I just full five-man power play stack the wild. Cap like Kaprizov, Boldy, Hartman, Zook, and Brock Faber on the point. Maybe I do something like that. 
I don't think I just stack Minnesota one and then just leave it. I think I turn into a power play stack or add Zuccarello or I do something like that to it because the power play matchup is so good that I think you want to get as much of it as you can if you decide to go in that direction. Yeah. I mean, it does kind of suck that Hartman is in the center, but again, like they've been avoiding putting Hartman there like the play since Joe Erickson act was there. So. Vegas Golden Knights with a 3.5 total heading into Calgary. The Flames have a 2.9. Dustin Wolf mercifully starting for the Flames. Like I, I don't think I could handle another Dan Vladar uh, start. I'm sure it's coming, but I don't know, man. Like Vegas isn't getting a lot of ownership, and they have the highest throw total on the slate. Eichel, Marcheseau, Barbashev, 18-4, 5.4% ownership. Like I, I know they're probably going to see a fair bit of the Coleman back. Back on Dryden Hunt line, but like, sweet. Okay. Uh, I don't I have an issue with that. Like, that. I also like the Carlson Dorfe of Amadio line. Yeah, there's there's new lines at, at Morris. Like back when Coleman Mangiapane was a line oh. for for Calgary, but Hubert Kadri Pospisil was a line together. Dryden, Dryden Hunt's down on the third line with Sharon Govich. Oh, fun, 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 fun. Doesn't really matter to me. Like, no, I, I still like the Eichel, Mark Chisot, Barbashev line. Um, Vegas is ramping up towards the playoffs. I like them. I also like uh, Carlson Dorfe of Amadio as a filler. I prefer Vegas one just for the power play guys. Uh, just, like Calgary's, we talked about it, lost their three best penalty killers. I like like Vegas one at five point four percent, or you know Pittsburgh at eight percent, whatever it is. I don't know. Like I, it's closer than you think when you we have to decide between them here. Um, I'm in on Vegas on the on the Calgary side. Like I just I just don't have a ton of interest. I, I just don't. My boy Zari's not back yet, and when he's back, yeah, we'll go back to to Kadri Zari Pospisil. But like Huberdo with with Kadri just. Feels bad, man. Just feels bad. Yeah, Kadri and Huberto just don't have good offensive numbers. Like, there's a reason why those two really haven't played a lot together. I think basically since like the first couple months of last season, um, they just haven't meshed well at all. Um, I get they're they're going to it because they're you got you got you got to play somebody when you trade everybody. But uh, the only line I would have any real interest in is that Coleman back Lamontipani. They are still generating well offensively, so there's still that. Um, it's not a lot to hang your hat on, but it's kind of fine. And like the Vegas top line, really good offensively. Defensive numbers a little bit below average, at least by expected goals against. So they're not stalwarts. So I think there is some merit to the backland line, but that's it for me. Um, it is it is the Vegas side I like best. Like my two my two highest rated stacks from this game are Vegas one and Vegas two. Uh, actually, Vegas one and Vegas three technically as they're listed. Um, I wrote up about uh, Jack Eichel in the picks article. Uh, he's six points in four games. All six points came in the last two games. Uh, he, I think it was two shot bonuses in his first two games and then two three-point games after. Like, he's been doing work since he came back. Him and Marshall and Barbashev are all in the top power play unit now. As you mentioned, Calgary's three top penalty killers are gone. No Jacob Markstrom is the big one. I mentioned in our Discord. I mentioned in the article as well. The difference between Jacob Markstrom and then the aggregate games between with Vladar and Wolf is quite literally a goal and a half every 60 minutes. It is I don't think there's a bigger drop off from starter to backup in the NHL. Uh so I really do like Vegas one. If you want to avoid that Coleman back to Manjapani line, um Dorfe and William Carlson have very, have very good numbers together this season. 2.9 expected goals for, 56% of the expected goal share, five actual goals per 60. Now that's shooting 15%, but they're generating so much that even 10% shooting would have them at about 3.3 goals per 60 minutes. They've been really, really good together offensively. Carlson Dorfe of Amadio, only 1.5% ownership per the top two stacks. Obviously, negative leverage, but it's not that bad. It's not bad as a filler stack, but it is Vegas one I like best in this game. Yeah. I I don't know. Like, Vegas feels like they're getting overlooked a little bit here. 
Let's talk about the late hammer. If you want to call it the hammer, it's more like the late spoon. Washington Capitals with a 2.5 total. Heading into Seattle, the Kraken have a 3.1. Washington just got absolutely mopped by Edmonton last night. Back to back on the road. I don't have any interest really in Washington. Seattle is a pretty good defensive team. You want to one off of Etchkin, fine. You want to one off Sonny Milano. You want to one off Dylan Strom. Hip, hip. Hooray. Uh, my interest is on the Seattle side and the Bjorkstrand, Tolvin, and Gord line coming in wildly over owned. 2.2% top stack, 11.6% ownership. That's just too much. I would go to the Eberle Beneers to Tar line, 10 8. 3.6% projected ownership. They have been very, very good. Um, that would be the line for me. You want to play McCann, Burkowski, Ty Cartier, go for it. You want to play the Bjorkstrand line, go for it. I'd rather get the lower ownership. But this, as a late hammer game, this game sucks. Yeah, the only line I have interest in is that Everly uh, Benier Sitar line. I wrote up Everly in the picks article today. 40 shots in his last 13 games, over three shots per game for Everly. That's really good. Um, he's skating about 18 and a half minutes, uh, over his last six games. So, you know, he, uh, they're still kind of trying to push for the playoffs. So he is getting more ice time. They're leaning more on the top guys with Tatar on the top line, 3.2 expected goals, 4.2 actual goals per 60, uh, in nearly 190 minutes together, a five on five. Like those are really good offensive numbers. Capitals are a bad defensive team, um, especially at this point of the season. That Everly, uh, Everly uh, Beneers to Tar line is the only line I have interest in, but I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm more interested in just like one offing Everly, one offing Bjorkstrand, one offing Jeremy Can, those types of things than I am in anything stacks. Yeah. Coming up after us, 5 30 p.m. Eastern NBA Deeper Dive with Lafayette and Josh, not me, Engelman. 6 30 p.m. Eastern NBA Live Before Lock with Greg Ehrenberg and Eric Lindquist. And 7.30 p.m. Eastern, playback, live stream, NBA Lotch Along. If you've seen it, it's a lot of fun. Um, but, yeah, let's talk a little bit about defensemen. Top of the board, Noah Dobson, Rasmus Dahlin, Victor Hedman, Shea Theodore, Zacharensky, Mike Matheson. I don't particularly love any of them. I think Rasmus Dahlin would be one for me, Shea Theodore, two. But I'm probably living in the mid range and the cheap guys. There's a lot of cheap guys that I like. Who are you liking? Yeah, Wierenski's at the top of the board uh, for me. Charlie McAvoy also there because of Montreal's poor penalty killing. Um, Shea Theodore in Vegas, uh, really good matchup against Calgary. But it is like the mid priced and lower priced guys that I do like better tonight. Like Jacob Chikrin and Jake Sanderson, obviously in their matchup. I wrote up Chikrin. Uh, in the picks article, more ice time, more peripherals and everything since Thomas Shabbat got hurt. Also a good power play matchup. Uh, Brock Faber, great power play matchup. Uh, Cam York, really been putting up a lot of block shots and a lot of minutes with all the injuries on the Philly blue line. Mo Cedar, um, he's a guy that can bring peripherals and does get good power play time uh, for Detroit. Miro Haskinen, great home matchup uh, against New Jersey. Great. But there's also a lot of cheap guys. So like I wrote up Bowen Byram again. He's only 3,900 on DK, 4,400, I think, on FanDuel. Like very, very playable. Olin Zellweger, he was up to like 23 minutes or 22 minutes for Anaheim or something in their last game. Like maybe there's a reason why they're giving up a lot of goals, but at least they're giving him an opportunity uh, to produce. Uh, Simon Nemec, obviously with all the ice time he's getting for New Jersey and, you know, all their bad defensemen, they have to give it to somebody. So uh, Nemec as well. Kyle Burrows for San Jose. Uh, more ice time means more block shots, and that's a good thing. Uh, Braden Schneider, 2,800 for the Rangers. He got a lot more ice time in their last game. Not a bad matchup for him. And I'll mention Mike Kesselring again. He got up to 18 minutes, I think, for Arizona. He's only 2,600. Pretty good matchup here tonight against a really bad Detroit team. Yeah, someone's got to play minutes on that blue line. Let's talk yeah, about they can't play Jersey and, and Moser for 60 minutes. So, I mean, they could try. If it was the Knicks head coach, they would. But, the, you know, this different sports. Tristan Yari, 80, you, you, it's rare that you see an 8,600 goalie nowadays. Tristan Yari, 8,600. I don't know if I want to do any of that. Uh, I think if I was spending up, which I don't particularly want to, it would probably be uh, Olmark. I do – Bacon kind of agrees. I do like Aiden Hill or whoever starts for Vegas. 
Yeah, it's Hill. Yeah. Uka Pekka Lukanen, 7,600. Obviously, Igor. And then for cheapies, I think... I think going back to Magnus Krona, honestly, it's 6,800. Forget the name. Forget the team. Pittsburgh puts up pretty high volume shooting. They just have trouble scoring, so I don't mind Krona at 6,800. Yeah, Krona's pretty good for cheap. Um, I also mentioned uh, Connor Ingram. Like, I don't have any faith in Detroit. Ingram's only 7,200. I wrote up Sergey Bobrovsky, like 7,500 going into Carolina. That That's perfectly fine by me. Uh, Igor, I think, is fine, even though, like, I worry about Tampa Bay because sometimes they don't shoot a lot. Um, and Rangers are better defensively without Truber. At least they have been. That's a little bit of a concern. Uh, also mentioned Charlie Lindgren. Like, uh, you know, he's only 7,300. I feel like if Washington wins that game, it's not going to be because they went, you know, blew Seattle out 7-1. It's going to be because Charlie Lindgren had a good game. Yep. Who are you liking for your hat trick pick? I, I feel like I'm going to, I'm giving a lot away of what I plan on do, doing tonight with my lineup, but uh, let's go desert dogs. Dylan Genther. Hey, it's all right. It, they, it's hard to dupe the cliffy. Uh, my pick is going to be Wyatt Johnson. I like it. I like it. A couple of young guys looking to get on the board here tonight. We will be back on Saturday. Sure, it's a nice big old slate with underwhelming GPPs, but we will be here regardless. Uh, good luck, everybody. Uh, if you want to sign up, click that link in the chat. We appreciate all the support, and we'll see you Saturday. Good luck tonight, everybody.